So, Bob, let's let's first start with before we get on to the substance of uh, to the extent that there is any substance at this point of the Republican tax plan. Just give us a sense of what the process is. I mean, at this point, where where are we on the process? What what has to happen? What can we anticipate going forward? Well, Republicans want to do this under a procedure that's known as reconciliation, which means they only need in the Senate. Uh, Republican votes to pass the bill with uh, 51 votes. Uh, And to do that, they first have to pass a budget through both houses uh, and then have it agreed by both houses, an agreed budget. And then they can pass the tax bill under reconciliation of that budget. The House has passed the budget. The Senate has not. So that's the first step. The Senate has to pass its budget. And then the Senate and House committees have to meet and make sure those two budgets uh, are reckon are the same, and then they go forward. And is it is it through that uh, conference where they uh, they take the House version and the Senate version that they would then uh, then we would see the the tax uh, reform, or is that um, a distinct? No, that's process? just to get. Yeah, that's a distinct process. That gives you the budget, the combined budget or the unified budget gives you the authorization to uh, do a uh, tax reform uh, that will equal, you know, X amount of money. Uh, And then the tax committees, which are already meeting in both the House and the Senate, uh, will come up with filling out the plan that was put forth by the administration or the framework that was put forth by the administration. And it will be limited by whatever the amount is in the budget that they will allow under reconciliation. Uh, And then... um, they have to pass that through the House, through the Senate, reconcile it, uh, et cetera. That probably, uh, well, they claim they're going to try to do it by December. Uh, many people are skeptical about that goal. And and so, and we should just add one more note that under the terms of reconciliation in the Senate, there's a subset of rules as to what, um, what can be done via reconciliation. This, of course, um, basically prevents any type of filibuster um, uh, of this bill. It prevents uh, the um, uh, the ability in the House, I guess, to amend it. But uh, in the Senate, uh, there's a couple of rules uh, known as the Byrd rules, which say uh, which which say exactly that um, this bill has to do with the budget and it cannot add to the deficit. Is that right? So that's why the budget needs to be done first so that it can basically there can be cuts that will allow for um, tax cuts, basically the reduction of revenue. Is that right? Right. And it can't add to the deficit after 10 years, which is why you see a, you know, in the Bush tax cuts, for example, the Bush, uh, the the reconciled tax bill that was passed uh, had um, some of the provisions uh, automatically uh, expire at the end of nine years so that it wouldn't violate the rule that it couldn't add to the deficit in the out years. Uh, They're going to face that on this one, too. And so uh, to the extent that there's um, um, there's uh, deficits created by this tax cut, they are uh, only within the first uh, nine years, and then theoretically the tax cuts would either would either uh, sunset or would have to be revenue neutral, essentially going past then. Right. Uh, now that's, that's it. Uh, now hasn't uh, Paul Ryan? Uh, he's told us since his days of sitting around a kegger in college, dreamed <laughs> of the permanent tax cuts that uh, Ronald Reagan was able to put in. Are they going to be able to do that at this point, or did they really need to um, to completely pull apart Medicaid uh, 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 under a repeal and replace a bill to to achieve that? Are they going to be able to do that in this context? Uh, It's going to be very difficult for them to do uh, what they plan to do. The the Ryan budgets through the years have always contained what uh, Paul Krugman called magic asterisks. That is, they would say, well, we're going to cut taxes this amount uh, and we're going to pay for it by closing loopholes and cutting spending in areas to be named later the asterisk. (laughs) And uh, now, of course, uh, if you're going to cut taxes, really, uh, you've got to fill in that asterisk. You've got to put in the budget the spending you're going to cut or put in the tax reform the loopholes you're going to shut. 
And that uh, starts to be a massive headache if you are going to try to have a significant tax cut because you're talking about uh, cutting not just uh, you know, foreign aid, which is the thing they always talk about, or waste, fraud, and abuse. You're talking about deep cuts in Medicaid and Medicare. You're talking about deep cuts in education and college loans and uh, Head Start and programs that, uh, you know, services that people truly rely on. Uh, And then uh, you're talking about in the corporate side, are you actually going to close some of these uh, loopholes or or do the corporate lobbies away and and block you from doing that? And you've already seen, you know, one of the things the framework called for was repealing the uh, state and local, the exemption for state and local taxes, which seemed pretty attractive because uh, they are, they tend to be high in blue states. And so it hurt democratic voters more because they tend to spend more on local services and have higher state and local taxes. Uh, But there's a lot of Republicans in those blue states and they're already up in arms about uh, the tax uh, uh, increases on their constituents. And so there's, there's already talk about not doing that as one of the major sources of revenue in the bill. Yeah, that um, that ran head headlong into uh, California and uh, New York State Republicans, who basically said, if you were to if you were to get rid of that exemption, you would wipe us out. There would be no way right. that we could exist um, uh, with our party. Um, creating that type of burden, particularly, obviously, for uh, their wealthier constituents. I mean, let's uh, th- let's be honest. That's who we're talking about uh, would be the, the most hard hit by that. And that became untenable for them. Another one that's been floated around, it seems to me, is the um, the mortgage, the home mortgage uh, interest deduction, which, again, is something that is enjoyed um, to a some extent by uh, uh, middle class um, uh, homeowners, but is a, a you know dollar for dollar a a, a tax uh, break that is enjoyed by uh, wealthier Americans by far. Right, a massive tax break for the more affluent, and uh, it's not going to survive. I mean, it, there's no way they're going to repeal the home mortgage uh, deduction. Okay, well, so with all that said, um, I, I want to take a break, and when we come back, let's talk about what we do know about these these uh, this attempt at tax reform. And ask, I want to ask you at this point, um, based upon the fact that it seems increasingly unlikely that they're going to be able to um, to extend this um, tax regime past nine and a half, ten years. Uh, even as they plan to do it, to the even if they can do that, uh, the real question becomes: Is is this really tax reform, or is it just tax cuts for the rich? Are we back to where we were in two thousand one with uh, George Bush? And is this basically just a payday? It's only going to be nine years long, nine and a half years long, and uh, the Republicans are going to have to try to do it again for their most wealthy donors. And also, when we come back, we're going to talk about the estate tax because that for uh, their, the, the super plutocrats is, um, in some ways, a golden chalice. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. <laughs> 